Eric to the World XP Podcast. This is episode number twenty-four. Uh, it's been a while. Last I last I heard, we were uh, we were in Carnegie Hall in New York City, performing a high school band together. And now I turn around, and you are a band director out in the Midwest. Oh yeah, yeah, crazy it's been story. Hot <laughs> mm-hmm. Crazy man, it's crazy. So I think uh, we we're just talking. You ended up at the University of Michigan, and you weren't entirely sure if you wanted to do music, but like any sort of um all related to athletics because that's what i know best but like like any sort of recruitment for college i would assume you had to start relatively like sophomore junior year of high school to start searching out which schools that you could audition for or apply to uh, and then get into that program is that sort of accurate yeah yeah so it it definitely starts really pretty early in high school Um, a lot of the times um kind of the the more typical path is everybody applies for a college that they that they feel will kind of get them the best out of the world. And then they kind of make a decision. Either they have an idea before they go there a little bit, or maybe they make a decision while they're there. Um, and music really kind of doesn't allow for that. Um, you kind of have to, you kind of have to know and start the process junior year at, at the very least. And, and I often tell people if you can start earlier, great. Um, but you, you mentioned Carnegie Hall, like when we were even there, I was uh, like, when you guys were at a certain thing, I was actually like in the basement of our hotel room and like practicing in auditions. <laughs> and like, that's just like, that's just what it was. And that's just what it was going to take to, to get into, into those places. And yeah, it's, it's a bit of a long, long process and a lot of, a lot of effort. And you really, you really need either a private instructor or, or, or a teacher that really knows Kind of that process because it's it is a different process and it doesn't start with an application um it really kind of starts with like scoping out which schools you like and what basically professors um because it's it's a lot like a mentorship mm-hmm. um when you're studying privately with a with a professor and then you just kind of get in contact and maybe you have a lesson just to see if you like that teaching style um and you basically start there and and from there you you look at all of their auditions about a year out or so and and start that process and practicing and you have you know your solos and sometimes you're going to be required to record your solos and and all of those things and it's it's a bit more of a process it's 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 uh it's quite hefty is it similar to the college athletic recruiting process and that you would go Right, you obviously scope out maybe the different schools that, that you look at, but do you have like the equivalent of like game film? So like if you have a solo in a concert or whatever, how, like how do you get in touch with those professors and then say like they determine that you're qualified before the, like do you have to go through something before the audition itself or is are there multiple auditions or like how does that sort of work? So usually it's, it's a little bit of openness and with yourself and the professor of <clears throat> they'll kind of talk to you and like, you'll, you'll ask for a lesson typically. Mm-hmm. Um, and they know what's up. They know why you're asking for a lesson. Um, they know it's generally because you have at least some interest in the school mm-hmm. and, or maybe you just want a positive experience out of it. But basically at the end of that lesson, they'll typically ask you some type of kind of, kind of question that's like, are you looking at coming here or like, what are your kind of career goals or something along those lines? Mm -hmm. Um, And they'll be candid typically. Like if they don't think that you would make it at their school, they'll often tell you right at that like first lesson before, like before you've even applied um, and let you know. And if not, then it's, you know, it's typically a very typical remark of like, you know, I'd I'd love to see you apply here or something along those lines, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so they kind of give you a kind of offhand idea um, of where you might be at. And then after that, you, you start the application process and then, and then you kind of get to the, like you mentioned, kind of the, the video, um, of like, okay, I'm like the first round of applications is typically some type of a video or, or sound file, um, that you're going to send them, um, that you typically go through different, different genres and eras of music and stuff on your, on your primary instrument and send that. And then, once you, if you get through the first round of applications, you'll typically be invited to a in-person um, application, um, which is basically like varies between the schools, but could be anywhere as candid as a lesson um, and could be as, as formal as in front of an entire kind of panel of professors. Um, 
and just kind of depends on the school. And after that, you'll either hear soon or you'll hear much later or, you know, there's, there's a lot of, like, I remember in high school, they were like, a lot of big kids were like, they knew in November where they were going. And then the next round came out in like January, February. And they're like, oh, I'm going here. And like most of the music majors, if you're applying for music schools, don't know at least until March. Mm -hmm. um, and then the actual, like, you don't hear about any type of scholarships or anything like that until April. And mm -hmm. so like often it's mid, mid April, early April, when you're deciding and everybody else is already like knows what dorm they're in. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a little nerve wracking. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a long process and a little bit scary. I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're playing for somebody that's not just, you know, at that, that school, the best, but like a lot of these professors are, professors that are like world renowned or known kind of amongst all of the incredibly <laughs> talented uh, orchestras. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're some high school student who thinks you're pretty good. And, you know, you walk into their world and like, you know, it's, it's, I'm sure it's equally difficult for them to kind of gauge the potential of someone mm -hmm. that is probably significantly far off from even being remotely successful in the field. Um, yeah. You mentioned um, lessons and just so everybody listening knows, what's, what sort of does a lesson entail, right? Cause you have like a private instruction like when you are just learning your instrument but then once you get up to the point where it's like an audition lesson is there a difference between that sort of lesson and like a lesson that somebody would normally think of or like what, what would that sort of lesson normally entail? Yeah, so it's, so your typical kind of like your usual private instruction lesson is, you know, you're going to work on scales, you're going to work on tone, you're going to work on basically the fundamentals of your instrument, mm -hmm. and then probably some either an etude or a solo, um, kind of like a short work or a longer, bigger work that you're, you're kind of building up towards. Um, and the college lesson is a little bit more of a kind of lesson performance, if you will. Um, you would never show up to one of those having not learned the solo, right? You'd want to you'd wanna basically have the solo down to the best of your ability. Um, and then you're kind, of, you're kind of hoping to get two things out of it as a student, as one is how do you interact with that professor, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have a good kind of working relationship and is their feedback really valuable to you? Um, or are they saying things that you're already hearing from your private instructor um, that you're still working on. And is that, you know, what does that mean for you? Um, as well as, you know, are they able to provide additional resources or give you a comment that you maybe have never heard before and kind of opens your eyes to your own playing and your abilities and you think, oh, wow, yeah, I, my, you know, my other instructor had never mentioned that. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe they prefer a specific technique that you have never experienced. Um, and it's a little bit of, you know, you walk in, you'll have a little bit of talking and then you'll basically play your solo or your etude or whatever you're, you're working on. Um, and typically it's a solo that you're gonna play probably for the audition later on, um, <clears throat> mostly so they can give you, they can give you feedback that will help you in your audition with them later. And, or they'll let you know like, hey, this wouldn't really cut it for an audition, right? Like this isn't hard enough or, you know, oh, this is amazing. You should definitely apply. Um, but yeah, it's it's not one of those ones you you want to seem unprepared or have a, kind of a, a bad first experience. It's it's like a pseudo interview, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, but it's very much going both ways. Gotcha. It sounds almost like they're trying to help you out to the best of their ability. So it's, uh, I guess other interviews I feel like are not are not as helpful as that usually because you're left often with like, I don't know if I did well or not, but I feel like with this, like you kind of know without them, without them saying anything, like if you played the solo well or not, like to your own ability, you kind of have a, a gauge of this went pretty well, even before they, before they say anything. Um, the solos that they give you, are they kind of, <clears throat> do they pull them from like, I remember like all districts, like all the way back in the day, like when you, when you would audition, those etudes were like, 
they didn't sound good musically. It was just so they could see like if you knew all the like necessary skills and they would just mash it all into one short thing. Or is it kind of similar to that? So it's it's much more the requirements are typically much more broad. Mm -hmm. um, they'll typically say like I've I've even seen some as broad as um, two pieces of varying styles. And it's like, you know, if you're just looking at that at base value, it's like, oh, that could be literally anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but typically that means, you know, a slow and fast piece and they don't give you the etudes. You have to kind of find them and, and purchase them on your own. Mm -hmm. um, and typically they are, you know, pieces that are extremely difficult for your instrument that you would probably play in college or just before college. Um, so we're talking like, Vivaldi or Hindemith or you know those like type of classical mm -hmm. instrument solos and you would never play like I would never play a generic solo right I would never play anything related to trumpet for my bassoon audition it has mm -hmm. to be kind of a historically difficult thing written specifically for your instrument because um, there's also an element there that they're looking at of kind of like how invested is this person right like if I don't if I pick like a general kind of euphonium solo or something they're going to be like this guy really interested in bassoon yeah. like i don't know what's what's going on here um so there's there's a little bit of that and and that can be really difficult if you don't have a private instructor or someone to guide you through that a little bit mm. um and so i i lucked out i had an amazing teacher in virginia and and she really knew the process and and kind of had a, a short list of of things that worked well and was really able to gauge kind of my strengths in playing and and it 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 worked out pretty well and I didn't you know I didn't have the most profound <laughs> solos to perform on because I I was not the best you know um, and it you know you a lot of times you're in high school and you're a big fish in a little pond right mm -hmm. and you know imagine every high school has another one of you. And they're all auditioning at your your university, right? Yeah. And so, like, when you look at it from that perspective, it's really hard to get in. And mm -hmm. it's not, they're not looking for more than maybe, you know, some studios have two people that they bring in every year. Some people have 10. Mm -hmm. um, but out of the whole country, that's, that's really tiny. Um, and it's a big, it's a big bet on yourself as well, because if it doesn't work out or you kind of went down the wrong road or you applied for a lot of them and it doesn't work out, then it, it doesn't work out. Um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit scary, but yeah, the, those, those pieces are typically historical pieces um, that you select and you have to purchase and record and all that stuff. But yeah. Was it nerve wracking trying to find the right one or did, or did, like how much time did you put into picking like the exact right one or was it more like let me get one for my instrument and then just work on it for like really hard or was it like how how did you sort of balance that because like if you spend more time pick, trying to pick it right. then you have less time to practice it and like right right how, how so do you balance that the the process of like you typically pick the piece somewhere in your junior year right because mm -hmm. auditions are typically senior year and if you're if you're getting it there it should probably take at least somewhere between three to six months minimum mm -hmm. um because you need to get it to the point where like you don't miss a note <laughs> right you don't you don't not play a dynamic you don't you like we're talking down to things of how fast is my vibrato mm -hmm. um and that's going to be the thing that they critique Very specific things yeah. um yeah and so typically you want you want a solo that's going to promote what you do really well. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like for me personally, I was not a very fast, um, I couldn't tongue very like specific notes very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and so like I picked one, one part of Vivaldi that was a little bit slower and I could really highlight both like my musicality and I could highlight my ability to like sustain pitch and mm -hmm. go through those slower sections. But you also have to pick something contrasting as well. So that for that, I went with um, kind of Hindemith and a little bit more of a kind of contemporary piece. Um, and I also knew that a lot of the professors that I was looking at um, really, really liked the idea of contemporary music. And so mm -hmm. you gauge what's available, what's kind of deemed credible, 
within the field. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of pick, okay, what can I play really well, I think. Um, and sometimes you'll have maybe three pieces um, or you'll have four when you start out. And then you start to get a month or two into it and you think, ah, that fourth one's, that one's not gonna make it. I'm not yeah. gonna be able to get that one, right? So then you narrow it down and then your focus kind of becomes more kind of, you know, horse with blinders of like, okay, I'm gonna nail this one piece, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's kind of, and sometimes maybe it's, you know, the Mozart bassoon concerto and you do all three movements of it, or maybe it's, you know, two completely different composers or different time periods. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the times you'll want to pick those pieces as well based off of the requirements. So let's say one university always like they, you have to play some movement of the Mozart bassoon concerto and another university wants a contemporary piece. Okay, well, if the other ones just have a broad description, I'm gonna play the Mozart mm -hmm. and maybe the Hindemith or something contemporary because I want that to fill the requirements for all of the ones that I choose. Um, so I don't okay. have to pick 16 pieces, right? Because that's at that point, you're not gonna play any of them at the highest of your ability. Um, and you really, you really want to make it so that there are really no mistakes. Um, and most of the critique hopefully comes from interpretation, right? Um, and historical background on the piece. Because otherwise you're gonna get that like, uh-oh. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. When you I have two, two sort of thoughts. The, the first is um, the, about the interpretation, but real quick before we get to that, when you get into the, um, those sort of lessons, are you, you know the pieces so well that you kind of just play them in your sleep type deal, or was or is there a lot of nerves sort of walking in? So I remember, I um, don't remember, I think it was junior or senior year, you would come back from some sort of audition or maybe all district or something uh, you had seemed very nonchalant about it, just in terms of like, you're just like, oh, yeah, it's, it's whatever. And like, I remember when I went in, I was nervous as hell. Is what sort of level of like nerves did you have going in? Or were you so comfortable with those pieces by that point that you were just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nail it? <laughs> I, I often go back to a quote that uh, my college professor would sometimes tell us is that you're never, you never get comfortable. You get comfortable being uncomfortable, right? And so like, I was never not nervous. I lucked out that, you know, a lot of people will like shake when they get nervous or they sweat a lot when they get nervous. I, after almost every audition, as soon as I was done and I didn't have to be like on, like my hands would just start shaking like immediately. And it was just like, whoa, I'm really glad that didn't happen five minutes ago. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you just get, you get more comfortable kind of putting yourself out there mm -hmm. and, you know, you're gonna, it, it's kind of a brutal thing where it's, you know, sometimes you get first, sometimes you don't make it at all. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it is, it's kind of terrifying. And, and part of it you have to understand is also one person's opinion. Right. And you have to kind of take both ends of that, of like, like you were talking about for, for district or states or something, you know, sometimes those are three people in a room that maybe have never played the same and they're judging you and it's like 40 other kids from the state. And do they know how hard this specific moment in the piece is? Not really. And other times they'll have like an actual like bassoon perfect like teacher. And it's like, oh, wow. Like they knew, like I can read their comments and they're like, oh man, yeah, they ripped me apart. Right. And, you know, like, so it, it's absolutely terrifying because you, you never know who you get. And that's to their credit, a lot of people that get to performance degrees, that's their whole life uh, mm -hmm. is they go through and, and the, their whole life is blind auditions. Yeah. And, you know, you just they have are... to try and hope for your best and, and put in every second and think, think back to it. Yeah. Um, but I also like, you know, there, you mentioned the, how much do you like work on it? And it's, I mean, there's times I went back probably a month ago and played one of my audition pieces from college and it like, it just fit right back in the fingers because I had played it so many times, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, it's like a part of your brain at this point. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you kind of have to be at the point where it's where it's almost memorized. Yeah. Um, Blind auditions are definitely terrifying because it's like, it's only you and your instrument and that's it. There's nowhere to hide. You mess up, that's it. It's just out there in the room 
and I remember I hated doing it. Um, but looking back, I'm, I'm glad I did um, just to have the experience of being uncomfortable in that room. Like you have to bet on yourself, like you mentioned earlier. And it's just like, it's one of those things, those experiences that you take with you um, yeah. <clears throat> later in life. Even for me, like I didn't go into music. Um, I still like music, but that's it. It's just like you, your instrument and the judges and that's it. And for people that don't like being like judged in like in that way, it's it's hard because it's just you're just there and then everything is just out there. If you mess it up. Yeah. And some people don't overcome it, but it's mm -hmm. I mean it's it can be a really valuable thing to take with you no matter what you go into, mm -hmm. um, for sure. And just like I said, being comfortable being a little uncomfortable mm -hmm. and, and kind of knowing that hopefully this works out. And if it doesn't, I'm going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Getting that sort of like, um, I'll, I'll, I'll worry about the next one. Like mindset, like forget about that one, move on is very, very valuable. I feel like in the audition world of music, like music specifically, but just like that world where it's like, if you mess it up, that's it. And then you just got to move on. Um, <laughs> and I have part of that with, um, like in high school, mm -hmm. like the, the state rankings and whatnot, mm -hmm. I'm sure like, because it went, I went eight, five, and then two. And I'm sure the expectation was like, oh, it's just going up. And like, mm -hmm. it was just luck that like all of those point values were by barely a point. Right. And it's, just, you know, they were all great players. And then my senior year, I got eighth back again. And part of it is because I spent less time and I like wanted to focus on the college auditions instead, but I'm sure that, you know, that's like, I'm sure our director was like, well, that's weird, but it's like, you know, like that's just <laughs> what it, and you know, it wasn't as good of an audition that I had had previously. And, mm -hmm. and I was okay with that. And it was like, okay, like hopefully I make it. And if not, I don't, it's okay. Yeah. I think that was the one where you were non more nonchalant about it after coming back from, because I think, by that time, like you said, you've been focusing way more on the college ones, but um, I want to go back to the interpretation piece that, that you mentioned a little bit before. And so, so when you go in and play and you get all like the technical stuff, right? As far as like, you don't miss a note, your tone's good, like dynamics, good, tempo's good, all that sort of stuff. What sort of comments come down? Like when you talk interpretation, because at that point, it's really just how you view that piece versus how they view that piece. And so it's not really a critique at that point, is it? It's more just like a discussion. Is that sort of how that goes? It's it's half and half. So some of it, depending on depending on the piece you're playing, some of it might be based off of historical context, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, if you're playing a piece that was played in the 1800s by somebody at the Paris Conservatory or something that was written for that instrument, there's an expectation to play grace notes a specific way or to, you know, do a certain cadenza for a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. or, you know, there, there's elements of that that are kind of unwritten rules of interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to lean in on this a little bit more and it's like, okay, I might've done that a measure early. And sometimes it's totally preference. And that's where kind of their expertise and opinion comes in. And there's other times where, you know, they'll correct you. And it's a little bit less of an interpretation where it's like, oh, no, you need to put an accent on this. Because if you listen to the recording, and not just the bassoon part, you know, the strings are having a down bow. And so they're going to naturally put an accent on that. And so you're going to need to as well. Um, and little things that, you know, you might have missed in a recording that, through their expertise, they're like, no, 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 you, you, you need to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where it's a little bit of, you know, like a little bit of trust between you and the professor um, mm -hmm. that, you know, they're, they're coming up with this reasoning for a purpose. And, you know, most, most do and some don't. And that's kind of the value that you, you place in trying to, to study with that professor. Um, yeah, Gosh, uh, it gets into that like super fine level of detail, even with like, for myself with soccer, depending on who I'm talking to or what sort of situation I'm in, you can go into that fine level of detail of like, no, his hips didn't open up in this exact way. So he should have touched the ball with the outside of his foot instead of the inside of his foot, even yeah. though like the result might be the same, but that half second that he would gain from touching it that way and then passing 
would send would like put that guy through on goal. But since he didn't do that, the defender was able to close the gap for like those little like super fine details that I feel like once you get to a certain level of expertise in whatever field you're in, that's where you see people get super passionate about it. And if you don't know, <laughs> if you don't know the subject, um, you get lost very easily in right. whatever the field is. Exactly. Like, I have familiarity with band, but even some of the stuff that you were just describing for interpretation, I was like, I don't remember hearing about that ever. <laughs> right. Um, but it's, yeah. it's cool to get to that level of like, that level of detail in whatever field you're in, because it's like, you feel as though like you, one can teach it to others, but two have like this expertise in something that like you, worked on for so long and you've built up and now you're now like you're seeing the results of it for you specifically because you're teaching um but just in any any situation um yeah there's a there's a moment of that i always remember back to that um i was i was in a lesson um and you know my professor asked me like why are you doing it that specific way mm -hmm. and i thought like first of all in the moment i realized kind of like you know my complete ignorance in the world and i was like <laughs> I don't know. Like, I have yeah. no idea why I'm doing that. And they were like, do you think it would be better to do it this way? And like, really just making me think about it. And then him giving me kind of the, the, the knowledge and my moment of like, oh my gosh, I know absolutely nothing. And, mm -hmm. and him just like, you should check out literally like this book on this page it gives you the exact specific number of like the speed of the trill based on some book that was written, you know, a hundred years ago, like hundreds yeah. of years ago. And you're like, Oh my gosh, I am, I, you know, like, yeah. I like teach me everything, you know, because like, I, I know nothing. And I think it's, it's really important. Like you said, w w in whatever field you're in to find at least one person and hopefully surround yourself um, mm -hmm. with people that know exponentially more than you. And, and, hopefully everybody has that one moment in their life where you go, oh man, I really don't know anything, right? Because that's a, that's a powerful moment to realize that like, I just need to soak up everything everyone knows like a sponge mm -hmm. um, and it's only gonna make you better, but yeah. hundred percent. And you have to take it the right way though. Um, like, and you have to take that moment as like, I need to learn more rather than, well, rather than not doing that <laughs> right? Um, because, and then you want to get to the point where then you're a, uh, cause that moment, at least for me, when I had it turned me into sort of lifelong, lifelong learner. Like, you know, people hear that expression often, but learning about all sorts of different things all the time, like always curious about new things, even if it's in like my field or not in my field, I'm still interested in learning new things because the more sort of well-rounded you are, it's like, it helps just in day-to-day -day life. Like I can have a conversation with you or I can go have a conversation with an entrepreneur or I can go have a conversation with like, like a professional soccer player about all about like their field and I can know enough to have the conversation. Obviously, like I just mentioned before, like the specifics of it might be a little bit lost, but just sure. to learn a lot about or a little about a lot of things as well can help with like both the super specifics of that one field or just being well-rounded as a person. I think both are equally as important. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's, I mean, yeah, I, I'm still with that. And I, I've kind of, that's kind of what, especially in education, what I, what I really push for. And I think what at least Michigan did a great job with is they kind of throw you off the deep end a little bit of mm -hmm. like day one, like freshman year, you're in a classroom. Right. And maybe you're not teaching in that moment, but you're watching a really good educator do what they do best. Um, and also getting put in scenarios where it's like, oh, I don't recognizing the moments where you think maybe I like, I don't think this person is as good as somebody else that I learned from. Mm -hmm. And recognizing in that moment what you can learn from that situation as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Like there, you can still learn from a moment that you think you won't use. Um, and analyze it into like, why is this something that I don't like? Um, and then, you know, either strive to get away from it or to lean into it and experience why that person is doing that specific thing and, mm -hmm. and kind of take advantage of either scenario, right? Like, hopefully you're not in a scenario where you're with someone that you wouldn't want to learn from. Mm -hmm. But if you are, 
recognize what you can get out of it so that when you are able to surround yourself with people that you think are just absolutely sensational, um, mm -hmm. you can you can really soak that up and be appreciative of that moment. Yeah, 100%. I always try and live by like the knowledge that everyone knows something that you don't. Mm -hmm. And just like, that's how I try and live. So it helps with that, like, like that situation that you mentioned. Um, I want to go back a little bit for you and talk about how you got into music in the first place. Um, just like what kind of sparked your passion for it. And then once you got into that, that stage in high school where you needed to sort of make that decision that you were like, yep, this is what I want to do. So what, what sort of, um, how did you get into that like throughout middle school and then high school? Like what, what sort of things shaped you in that way? Yeah, I, I mean, you, you'll hear every musician always say this, that they, you know, they grew up in a house of musicians or like, you know, that kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, my grandma would do piano lessons and she always played organ and piano. And so, although it was never like really pushed on me, mm -hmm. it just felt like something that most people at least had an aspect of their life involved in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I enjoyed it and I listened to music and you know, middle school and I, like, I think it was fourth grade, maybe I picked up a bassoon and it was just pure coincidence that like, I could make a sound on the reed and my hands were just big enough to reach like across the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And they were like, yeah, do you want to do this or horn? I was like, bassoon, sure. And like, just random, like, you know, mm -hmm. you don't think about it in the moment. And so I went through and kind of continued on and and, you know, I, I moved a fair amount when I was younger and then I got to Virginia and, you know, they had good music programs in the schools and I, I enjoyed them. And at a certain point, you know, like I, I loved science as well. I was, I was a mm -hmm. big science person and um, I really kind of found passions in both of those. And at a certain point I was like, well, I don't really know. I don't know specifically what I want to do, but I know what I'm passionate about. Um, and at a certain point in, in high school, you know, like you win an audition or two and then your teacher tells you like, you might want to look into this. And I kind of thought like, huh, <laughs> you know, like maybe that is something I could do. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we went through it and, and I don't know if I'd mentioned this, but like, I, I wasn't a hundred percent certain that I wanted to do music sure. going into college. I, I was, I knew I was passionate about it and I loved it. Um, and I didn't know, I didn't know if it was going to work out. Um, and I really lucked out um, with my professor in Michigan and he kind of has a scientific mind about music and a logical kind of description of things. And there was a moment I remember that he described a technique on bassoon that, you know, everybody just does on bassoon. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh yeah, this is why we do it. Cause it breaks the harmonic. And I was like, just completely blown away. And like, it was a scientific explanation. I was like, that is so cool. <laughs> and it was like, and it was in that moment that I, I was like, oh, this could, this is really something that's really kind of profound and, and really works on a lot of different levels. Um, there's kind of an, an ever, ever spinning tornado of knowledge that you, you kind of have to have in that field. Um, and then I just thought like, man, so many people should be, should be aware of this at least. Um, and then I thought, well, <laughs> like if I want people to appreciate it, I should teach them to appreciate it. And hopefully, you know, like I always tell my students here, like it doesn't matter to me if you go into music, you don't need to go into music to get, you know, like my happiness. Mm -hmm. I just want you to like hear a, mu a song on the radio and be able to critically analyze it or to promote the arts or fight for the arts and understand that it's an important part of people's lives. And I thought, I mean, I got to do that. Like, it was just a moment of like, I feel like I'm at least okay at this. <laughs> and I like, I, no matter where I'm at, even if I'm not good at it, I'm going to get better at it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I was lucky to be at an institution that really trained us well to do that. Um, and that's, that's just kind of where I got to. And it just, you know, just kind of like, little steps here and there of, you know, not knowing where it might take you. And like, you have an end goal and then you just take a little step this way and go, huh. And kind of, you know, like it's a parallel path maybe yeah. or something along those lines. And, 
and you know i i wasn't one of those people that was like i'm going to do this you know 100 mm -hmm. and it's just gotten more and more interesting every time i do something related to it um gotcha yeah. that makes sense you mentioned the whirlwind or tornado of musical knowledge that's always around you and, and those sort of places i know in uh, the other sciences right when people are doing sort of like research or trying to discover new things are there like is there an equivalent for that in music like is there like new techniques that like people are trying out or is it more sort of like how does that sort of work in the like the musical knowledge or musical theory sort of realm of things like is there because obviously you would have to discover new things but you don't think of people discovering music as like a normal thing if that makes sense yeah how does that sort of work um let's see there's there's probably two sides of that coin Mm -hmm. um, that one of them would be the performance side of it. Um, and then the other one is probably education and teaching. Mm -hmm. Um, and a, in a lot of ways they overlap. Um, but I think in the performance side of it, there's always, there's always new music to be written, um, that are going to require new techniques on an instrument that are going to create new sounds that people have never heard or combinations of sounds. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that is a, that is a moment of, you know, having a vast knowledge of what's happened um, and then experimenting with what you can do. Um, things that have never been done before by people that have never created that before. Um, and there's, you know, that can range from anything from a composition to, um, I know there's a, there's a, there's a chamber ensemble from Michigan that they, they use uh, clarinet, bassoon, saxophone, oboe, and bass clarinet. And that was like an arrangement of instruments that was not really considered a prominent thing in the field and now is the new norm um and it's kind of a kind of an interesting thing to change that world um on the ed side of it it's i mean especially at the teaching the high school level there is just an absolute plethora of things you have to be aware of at, at any given time um, yeah. because you have your day-to-day -day band curriculum Mm -hmm. um, you have, you know, all of the things that are outside of your world that are like pep bands, marching bands that you're going to be working with athletic departments and, right. you know, you're going to have to know how their sport works mm -hmm. and how, like what the rules are for playing there. You're going to have to know like the business side of it, right? Like if you are running a band budget and or a booster program, you're essentially running a small or not so small business. Um, that you're going to have to look for your needs this year, as well as how to grow for five to 10 years, um, right. as well as recruitment and people. And all of that is just the extra on top of what the district or school considers you to be doing your, like your job well, right? Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the day, most people are like, oh, did the band sound good? Yeah. Okay, cool. Right. Like, yeah. and that's kind of their evaluation of how well you do your job. And that's mm -hmm. really just a teeny tiny portion of of what is actually entailed in the job um, that really isn't on the job description right <laughs> that you really kind of know either from your experience of training in college or you know getting thrown off the deep end and just going wow there's a lot more yeah uh, but yeah i feel like all the other stuff the sort of the marching band and the booster program sort of this it depends on the school itself and how mm -hmm. good like using football as the, the marquee normal example, for instance, if the school is not very good at football, then it probably, you will have less to do, I would imagine, in that sort of department. Is that something that you found? Yeah, it's it's super dependent and it it's based on region and state. And like you said, what the school's other strengths are. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some, some programs might not have a marching band, but they have five jazz bands or vice versa. And maybe they have an amazing chamber ensemble program. Um, and it really depends on what is available and what your goals are. So maybe they don't have a jazz band. Maybe you want to work with the community to build a jazz band. And I think that's also an important part is, is not only forming relationships, but also forming that trust um, with the community that you're involved in, um, that you're really like, you are really there to help 
everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, and it takes a little bit and it's, I, I was fortunate enough to, to land my current job that, I mean, we have all of those programs and the kids are just so exceptional and hardworking that almost all of those programs are strong. Um, you'll often hear directors say like, oh, we're a marching band school or, oh, we're Mm -hmm. a jazz band school. And like, we're fortunate enough to be all of them. (laughs) And I, you know, I also have coworkers, there's two other band directors that, you know, we lean on each other and work with that. And, you know, it's a lot of relationship forming and, and Mm -hmm. understanding and being a little empathetic as well of what other, you know, what other things are, because there's a lot of times where you're like, well, I want this for my band program. Mm -hmm. And that's just, maybe not a possibility right now. Yeah. And so you have to both accept that moment and also think, okay, how can I make that happen? Mm-hmm. And, you know, am I required to? No, <laughs> but does it, does it make a better education for kids? Hopefully, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's the goal. Um, and so there's, there's a lot that goes on outside of it, um, outside of the kind of nine to five or yeah. eight to five that, that, kind of goes unseen um but hopefully you've you've worked with the community enough that they're appreciative of yeah this is an interesting interesting point you mentioned you have two other band directors obviously well not obviously for those listening but obviously for you my only experience has been with there's only been one band director how is how is it working with two other ones in terms of like um like for example, when we were when we were in school, we had like the winter concert, and then like the I don't even remember what it was called, where you get evaluated at states or no band festival or whatever it was festivals, called. Festivals, yeah, yeah, we, festivals, and then we'd have like the spring concert, and our band director would just choose the songs and direct for all of them. How does that work for your for you guys? Do you have multiple bands, or do you kind of like switch mm-hmm. off? different like different like you're like oh I'll take the winter concert this year like how does that sort of work for you guys yeah so I I lucked out that my current job was relatively kind of similar to my student teaching Mm -hmm. um, when I was in college where it's basically they had two directors at the high school at student teaching and it was you know I'll help you and you help me and at the end of the day we're all here for kids Mm -hmm. right and so I landed into a program that is so much about that and with two Mm -hmm. guys that know so much more than me in a lot of things that I really like that was part of my decision um when accepting the job was man these guys are on top of it right like they they have done some amazing things and yeah I think I can add to this program but I'm also here to learn from them right and I want to know I want to pick their brain a little bit and they like it it helps a lot in terms of all that extra stuff I mean, on average, we probably do, you know, like you say your contract is 1500 hours. Mm-hmm. We're probably at double that, right? Like whether it's after school events or competitions and stuff like that. And I think it allows us to really kind of move workload between each other in a way that helps the program and the school and kids and use our connections as well of like, hey, I know this cool group do we want to bring them into the school and kids can mm-hmm. see this? And, you know, like, is there a way to grow this? And it's like, oh man, my plate is just full. In one program, it's like, there's there's only so much one person can do. Mm-hmm. And in this, it's like, oh man, I like, this person's stressing out. Like maybe my, my colleague is just absolutely stressed to the T and they're just working their butt off. And it's like, okay, I have an off week. Like I, I don't have much going on. Um, so I can help them out a little bit. And we we typically make make it kind of a, like a three headed dog, really (laughs) of like, you know, winter concerts, spring concerts, all that. We like each of us conducts a piece Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, there's maybe there's three of us and two of us are kind of like the heads in that band class. And the third one kind of does the administrative side of things in that class. And then it rotates or all of those things. And, and, and we've, I think we've been pretty good with each other of working and thinking like, okay, how do we all get what we want out of teaching, right? Like, I don't want to go into teaching to only do paperwork, right? I wanna see kids and and get those connections and stuff. Um, And I think we've been really great about, you know, trusting each other and and talking openly with each other about like, hey, I'm feeling this, or 
hey, I saw that thing that we did last week. I don't know that it worked well. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, no, I really think if we give this another week, it'll, it'll go great. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's, it's really worked out. And I, and I almost wish that a lot of other high schools would be open to the idea of at least two, two kind of people to kind of have a little bit of ebb and flow um, between the workload. Because it, it is an immense workload. It is not... I mean, a lot, not a lot of teachers go the typical nine to five anyway. Right. Um, they usually bring their work home, but I mean, it's, it's all of that plus all of the rest, right? Yeah. Like the small business and, you know, the equipment and stuff like that, that mm -hmm. is just, it's kind of crazy at times, you know? Yeah. The equipment um, in itself and like coming back and forth from concerts, we have all like the rental tuxes and dresses for, for everyone. And like, that's a whole nother thing that it's just yeah it's a mess because you have different kids be like oh i lost my bow tie <laughs> like, oh, right right oh, yeah the, there's also the kid like, element of it of yeah. just like oh i don't have my music today and it's yeah. like you know in the moment you're probably like oh my gosh i'm juggling 40 things and you can't even hold a piece of paper you know what i mean <laughs> but it's like you can't be upset with them in the moment and it's no. like okay all right you know we're all learning <laughs> it's, yeah how is um how has it been teaching in covid because i'd imagine that it's hard to actually play over zoom um, yeah. So how have you guys sort of dealt with that and how have you guys created new sort of solutions for, for teaching in this pandemic? Yeah, so there's, you know, everybody signs up to band for band either to be with their friends mm -hmm. or to play music or some combination of the both. Um, and that's really hard when the main thing that you're doing is the thing you can't do. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so, you know, when this all started last March, which seems like literally yesterday, yeah. um, it was it was a little bit of, okay, like we're gonna take two weeks off and we'll see you back in April, right? Mm -hmm. And then it, you know, kind of became, okay, maybe, maybe not, like maybe this oh. will go to May. Um, and it became an ever adjusting kind of thing because the moment you can go back to regular band you want to play music, mm -hmm. but until that time comes, you're going to have to kind of create curriculum that we can do. And, and so we started with what, what do we want kids to get out of this? And what do we want kids to learn? Mm -hmm. And we said, well, we can't get rid of performing, right? There's an aspect of band that you have to be able to play an instrument. And so a lot of that kind of came onto the kid's side of like, okay, we're going to send you this etude or this exercise mm -hmm. and we're going to have you record it um, and send it to us, right? And so, you know, the recordings aren't always great and, you know, kids, you know, maybe can't always record that week and life gets in the way and stuff and you have to understand that that's, that's what comes. And then yeah. we, we also had, so we had both um, kind of what we call asynchronous, which is like on your own time and mm -hmm. then synchronous, which is like, during the regular school day. Yeah. Um, and for all the stuff during the regular school day, we were like, you know, kids want to interact with each other, but they also want to continue to learn stuff about band. Mm -hmm. So we kind of thought like, you know, what things would be interesting or cool or fun um, for them to learn about. And we thought, well, wow, like all the things that we don't have time for when we're trying to get a concert ready and we're like, oh my gosh, we got to get those notes down faster, everybody, right? Like mm -hmm. all of those things that we don't get to of like the history behind a piece or, you know, how to like, when I say as a band director, like, oh, that's, you know, that chord's not fitting in. Well, what do I really mean by that? You know, mm -hmm. um, all of those elements of band that, you know, we, we kind of take for granted a little bit and yeah. we kind of dove into those and we, we did, you know, I mean, at this point, we've we've covered a lot because it just kind of it kept, it kept going. Yeah. Um, but we, I mean, we've done things between like actual composition. Um, mm -hmm. We've done um, written kind of music theory. We've done oral theory, um, which is like being able to identify chords and sounds just by the sound of them. Um, we've done things with film music um, mm -hmm. and kind of analyzing, you know, what does how is that different than regular band or classical music. Um, we've studied music of the world, um, so music of different cultures that they might not be accustomed to. Um, we've done like jazz theory. We've done <laughs> like what it takes to um, like create a marching band show, right? Like, cause a lot of kids, you know, like the director just says like, 
boop, here you go. Here's the marching man show. And everybody's yeah. like, cool. And so like some kids are like, well, how do you come to that decision? Mm -hmm. um, and so we just thought, you know, at the very least, hopefully that's something that's interesting. Um, and, you know, I, I think a lot of kids got a lot of things out of it. And we also gave them the choice in there as well of like, there was, there was one section where, um, my colleague was doing kind of written theory and I was doing film music, right? Mm -hmm. And so they happened at the same time and we kind of split the class in two, but we give them the option of like, hey, which one do you want to learn? Um, because we also recognize like, this might be really terrible for some kids. Like they may really not want to do film music or music theory or something. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to give them the option to continue to enjoy what they're learning, right? Like yeah. hopefully they're already, they enjoy bands regularly. Um, and we want to allow it so that the enjoyment at least continues, even if the subject has kind of changed very slightly in one direction or another. But Yeah. Has there been any talk sort of, um, as sort of sports get back to normal, has there been any talk about marching band being able to to sort of go again, or not yeah, so much? So, our school has kind of started up, kind of fall sports in spring, if you uh -huh. will, mm -hmm. um, and then they're also going to do kind of an abbreviated spring sports. Um, the regular it, marching band's a weird thing, right? Because mm -hmm. it happens; it starts up in like August or September. And typically the directors are planning it sometime around January to, to March. <laughs> and that's just how long that process takes um, to create that type of show. And, you know, last year we were at the same point where we kind of like, we had a show ready to go and March rolled around and we went, oh, right. Like you've put in months of work and then someone just goes, nope, it's probably not, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, we're more hopeful right now um, that we think it will happen. Um, but we can't, you know, it's a little bit of kind of pro bono, if you will, <laughs> where it's like, you know, we're going to throw in hours of work and hopefully it pays off for kids in the fall. And, you know, with vaccines that are rolling out and people taking precautions more seriously and stuff, um, we have high hopes and there's still a lot of time um, mm -hmm. until then. But yeah, I mean, as sports kind of, kind of <laughs> trailblaze the way, if you will, um, they're more open to kind of music and playing music and, you know, choir can sing with masks on and orchestra mm -hmm. can play with the mask on and cause you know, they don't necessarily need that. And, right. and bands a little bit of kind of the, the odd man out. And mm -hmm. Like we'd either need like a slit in the mask or like to, you know, put it under the mask and, you know, based on, you know, a, a band class that might have a hundred kids in it. That's yeah. really not a thing you want to do. Say Definitely and not. So, you know, we're trying to take band classes outside as it gets warmer and, you know, you know, things that are still safe that might give an aspect of the class that they actually signed up for. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully as we get to the fall, Marching Man kind of spins back up and, you know, as, as we're allowing more and more people, at least outside to hang out. And, and on the plus side, Marching Man, you can literally write in the drill how far away you want everybody to be from each other. Exactly. So there is that as well, that you can kind of mold it to what you need a little, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think outside seems, from from what I've seen, at least with the soccer that I've been playing and stuff, outside seems pretty pretty safe. Um, obviously I'm not an expert or anything, but we've been playing for some months now and we've only had one positive case and it was back in like last June and they went and quarantined and then nobody else got it. We've been, we've been good. So hopefully knock on wood for you guys. I think that the kids will, will, will really enjoy being, being able to play again, hopefully. Um, I remember uh, I, I saw a meme and I, I think I sent it to you. I'm sure you got it sent a gazillion times of kids in, I don't even know, like little tents, just yeah, like, it's like, a, you know, like a basically self quarantined tent. Yeah, like, like little tents. Yeah. And the funniest one was the kid with the tuba. You couldn't even fit. Um, but you on your Instagram story, you've been posting, I think, pretty much every day the numbers of cases and deaths. Why why did you take it upon yourself to to do that? Part of it was, I mean, it started for me of like, you know, back in March of last year, mm -hmm. we saw like a lot of news of 
this is really, this is insane. Like, this is going to be crazy and like stay inside and all this. And, you know, I looked out the window and it looked normal. And I, you know, for me, I needed Like I wanted some data that was like, oh no, this is like, this is like every day, this number is changing and going up. And then, you know, like it got to June and I'm like, man, I'm like, I'm already sick of this. <laughs> and it, it became kind of like an endurance thing of like, nope, we're not out of the woods yet. Like, don't, don't give up on this yet. Um, and, it, you know, it was a little bit a reminder to other people as, as well of like, you know, here's where we're at. Um, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? And, you know, also a little bit of a reminder that like, you know, some of us have been fortunate to not have anyone that they know directly affected by it. Mm -hmm. And a reminder that, you know, there, there are people that have a chair missing at their dinner table um or that that have really gone through just horrific times and situations and and are still persevering and, and going through and and the effects that that can have and just kind of a constant reminder to myself that like i'm lucky in a lot of ways and i need to remember to to be responsible for other people as well for for the people that may not have my lucky of a situation um and yeah just I, I wanted to kind of record that and, and remember it and be able to look back on it. Yeah. And, you know, you have to look at history, otherwise it repeats itself. And that history can be yesterday. It can be a hundred years ago, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it started mostly as a, as a personal thing to kind of just remember and, and stay on focus and, and on mm -hmm. track. And, but yeah. It's not been, it's been, Every day I see it, and so, some days I'm like, "Yeah, we're, we we gotta keep going," and then other days I'm, <laughs> I see it, and I'm like, oh, "He posted it again." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I, I, you know, there's an element of that too that that I really thought I was like, "Am I?" You know, for the people that have gone through things, am I a daily reminder of those traumas, right? And I'm like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, and I thought, "No, like they can un like they can unfollow my stories," and mm -hmm. like. I, I was like, if it if it's gonna make someone unfollow me or something, I I'm okay with that, you know. Yeah. But yeah, it's yeah, I'm sh I'm sure I've been, you know, a little bit on there, and people are like, oh my god, like oh, it posted some, oh, it's an ad again, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know? No, but I, yeah, I definitely, I wanted to ask and get your take on it because obviously it's been almost a year of you doing it pretty much daily, so I wanted to get your take on why you were doing that. That's a that's an interesting. I like it. It's a good reminder. Um, different people do different things to sort of remind themselves or cope or, or kind of like keep themselves on track. And if that's your thing, then yeah. the more power to you. Um, you are also doing, are you doing private or were you doing private lessons before the pandemic as well? I was not. Um, I have a lot of friends that were, mm -hmm. um, that that's, you know, that's a, that's a big source of income and, mm -hmm. and it's hard. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people, are not doing in-person lessons and they have to do lessons, you know, like, like we are like over zoom and, you yeah. know, and it's, it's not the same and it's, no. it's, it's taxing. And I think it's especially taxing on kids um, that are really like, they just want to hang out with each other and, mm -hmm. and have a little bit of fun. Um, and I think they deserve that before they kind of go into the daily stresses of adulthood and, yeah. and you know, they're not getting that. And it's, it's tough, um, but yeah, no, I, I was not personally doing lessons um, before then, um, but I know a lot of people that have gone through that, that, you know, it's, it's hard and they're trying to find different ways to, different ways to reach out to people and the community and all that stuff. But. Yeah. What is the, uh, what does the future look like for you as far as uh, been like directing private lessons have you ever thought about going trying to go into the sort of the performance based stuff or do you like education more or sort of what does the future look like for you yeah so I so my degrees are in bassoon performance and music education mm -hmm. and it kind of it technically gives you the avenue for both and for me I realized pr pretty early in college I was like I don't know that I want the performance life um, I absolutely love performing um, and there's just certain elements of it that I, I thought at least were going to be too stressful down the road. Um, and, you know, 
in the moment I could have thought like, oh, well, I don't need a performance degree. And I thought, no, I think it's important. Like I felt it was important to be the best musician I could on a personal level so that I could teach to that level um, later on. And I, and I think I'm, you know, I'm fully into the education side of things. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of avenues that can come from that after just graduation, right? I mean, there's, you know, there's teaching, you know, public schools, there's teaching at the college level, um, there's getting advanced degrees and all of this. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of a, a kind of, you know, paths diverging type of thing. And it's a little bit weird in, in especially music ed, um, where um, a lot of programs, you know, you can get a bachelor's and immediately apply for a master's program. Mm -hmm. And in music ed, a lot of the time, you're almost, in a lot of schools, they don't allow you to do that. Um, you actually have to have public school teaching experience. And sometimes that's one year, sometimes that's five years. Um, and so there's that element as well that I think is in the end, a great thing. Um, I think it like, if you're gonna teach people how to teach K through 12 at the college level, you probably should have done it at some point, right? Like mm -hmm. there's an element that's like, you kind of have to get your hands dirty a little bit to teach it. Yeah. Um, but I am, you know, I'm very happy with where I'm at. I, I mean, I have, a, I have a great job and amazing colleagues and really like there are days where I think like, oh man, this is just, I mean, it is so much work and it's so stressful and sometimes it just feels like underappreciated or something and you know one kid walks by and says hey thanks for doing this and you're like okay all right we're coming back tomorrow you know what i mean and it's yeah. like so it's it's a little bit of that and and you can also you have to take a little bit of a step back as well at least for me and and like you know sometimes i'll go to like our booster web page and i'll like see people that we've brought in it's like like, yeah, we are like, we're doing things here. We're, we're making stuff happen and, mm -hmm. and hopefully providing a really good thing for kids. Um, and, and we're seeing more and more of that. And it's sometimes really hard to do that in, in the trudge. And I think it's the same with any job, right? Like there's elements, there's elements where you kind of have to wade through the mud a little bit. Yeah. And it's like, oh man, this is just the worst. Yeah. And you kind of have to think like, why like why am i here and sometimes i ask myself that every day sometimes it's oh man it's been a year how am i doing <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um and you know it's it's sometimes hard in that capacity and i think there's there's some statistic that's like most most teachers or i think maybe it's music ed you know teachers don't make it past five years mm -hmm. like they'll, they'll teach for five years and then they go into either a related career or something completely different right and it's mm -hmm it's difficult. There's, there's a lot of aspects of education that are counterintuitive or that may not work best for the system or a perpetuation of some aspect of the system that isn't working. And, you know, you, you kind of have to ask like, what, wh what is the end goal? Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with where I'm at and, you know, like we're, we're going forward and there, you know, there's changes you want to make with anything and, and yeah, you kind of, as long as your head's above water and you're, you're kind of moving along, that's, that's kind of what you're looking for, I guess. Yeah. hundred percent. You have a, um, you have a website also, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, Eric Rothger music. Um, it's just kind of a, just kind of a website where I had initially just, I thought, well, like in all of the, in all of the interview process and like stuff out of college, you know, sometimes there are, there are administrators that are hiring you that don't know really a lot about music or the field or like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, they, we all have a degree, but what have we done? Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> like on paper, we can look very, very similar. And I thought, well, here's an avenue that I can really throw out what I feel like I have found or spent time doing in college. And it's just kind of turned into a little bit for me, a reminder of things that I've done mm -hmm. of like, things that I'm, I'm, I've done and I'm proud of and I'd like to continue doing um, that are a little bit of a reminder for me. Um, 
but yeah, it's <laughs> it's not it's not anything too fancy. Um, I'm sure half the pictures on there now don't even look like what, <laughs> what I do now. You know, like it was probably just fresh out of college and and that's what it is. But yeah, it's it was a little bit there and a little bit of, you know, self self reflection as well. Like there's mm -hmm. there's a teaching philosophy on there. And I was like, yeah, I should write a teaching philosophy. And then I thought, like, what is my teaching philosophy? You know, like, <laughs> what do I want people to get out of music education and stuff? So, yeah, it was a little bit of that. But <laughs> yeah. That's good. Well, Eric, we've done, it's been a, a little over an hour. Guys, go check out his website. We'll get the, uh, we'll get all the links in the description for, for that. Eric, it was a pleasure to have you on. Um, keep working hard. I'm sure the, I'm sure your kids enjoy having you as a teacher. Um, keep working, man. I know like when we were little, those teachers that like tried to make, put in the extra effort to make things fun for us definitely had a, had a big impact down, down the road. And I tell myself that when I'm coaching, like remember that one coach that I really liked, like be that for them. So um, you're doing good things, man. It was good. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's been an course. absolute blast. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's been a pleasure. I'm sure hopefully once, uh, once COVID sort of, sort of goes away, we'll be able to get you back on and we can have uh, more discussions about your marching band <laughs> and what they're doing, but sure. it's been great to have you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Eric. Yep. Bye everybody.